Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, uh, to speak here. So my talk is about, uh, well, my talk will contain information uh, uh, from these three papers here. Uh, already last year, Niklas uh, gave a talk at the conference in London about uh, this uh, subject. So this time I will review a little bit what Niklas said. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, um, what's contained in this more recent paper. So we all know that uh, integrability in N equals 4 has been very successful. Uh, it works very well. We managed to compute anomalous dimensions of local operators. Uh, these are very non-trivial functions. Um, now, in this talk, what I want to discuss are uh, a different class of observables, uh, which are Wilson loops. So more precisely, I will discuss a supersymmetric version of these Wilson loops, not the Wilson loops that you're uh, probably more used to. Um, now, already, we have a pretty good uh, story for Wilson loops. Um, the, uh, there are methods to attack uh, this problem, computing them uh, using integrability, um, and we can get pretty far, but uh, up to now, I think there's still the extent to which integrability can be used to compute them, it's still, uh, it's still uh, an open question. So what kind of Wilson loops? Uh, this is the first question. Um, so there are several types of Wilson loops we could think of. Uh, there's the BPS Wilson loops. And the BPS Wilson loops um, can be computed exactly. They can be computed exactly using a technique of uh, supersymmetric localization. And uh, this only, this even works to, uh, to higher order in, in one over n. So, um, we don't, um, we don't really use integrability in the, in the usual sense here. Um, the disadvantage of these operators is that they're pretty uh, restricted, pretty limited set of, uh, of such operators. Um, then the second uh, class of Wilson loops we could think of are light-like uh, polygonal Wilson loops. So these are interesting for several reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, uh, they're part of a duality with scattering amplitudes. And, uh, but we can also consider them in their, in, their, in their own right. So they're just some observables which form a closed class uh, of observable under uh, conformal transformations. They have some drawbacks. So uh, it turns out that they are divergent. We need to regularize them. And once we do that, the regularization breaks uh, some of the conformal uh, symmetry. Now, once we have this type of operators, it's very natural to um, supersymmetrize them. And uh, there are several ways we can supersymmetrize them. We can uh, have a chiral supersymmetrization, which is actually um, giving us the uh, supersymmetric Wilson loop, which is dual to scattering amplitude, uh, amplitudes. We can also have a non-chiral um, supersymmetrization. And uh, just uh, as a general idea, the, uh, what we do uh, to define these operators is uh, use a super connection in super space. So instead of defining a Wilson loop using a connection in space time, uh, we extend this and we, uh, we use a super connection in super space. And I will detail this a bit, uh, a bit more. Uh, before getting there, I have to emphasize that uh, the advantage of these Wilson loops uh, with respect to the usual uh, Wilson loops is that more of the symmetry is manifest. So for usual Wilson loops, even usual supersymmetry is not manifest. But once we consider them in super space, then uh, supersymmetry uh, can be made uh, manifest. Uh, there's, 
yet another type, uh, which is going to be the one I will discuss most in the end. Um, so now I'm considering the case of a smooth loop. So before I was discussing the case of uh, polygonal uh, contour, but now I have a smooth loop and um, it also has a coupling to the scalars. I will show you uh, in more detail uh, what it looks like. Uh, but uh, the main point I want to emphasize now is that this quantity is finite. So we checked it to one loop order. Uh, a proof to all loops is not uh, yet available, but uh, we think it's true. Since this is a finite operator, um, the way the symmetries are realized is much more obvious. So since uh, integrability is in a large part uh, uh, understanding the symmetries, this is very helpful. So this is what we start with. We start with a bosonic version. Bosonic version is defined like so, uh, equation one. Uh, so I have uh, a theory with uh, n colors. A is the ga gauge connection. I have uh, six scalar fields, phi i. Um, and then the contour is defined. Um, it has a component which lives in space time here. Uh, and a, a component which lives on a, a sphere of radius, radius one. So this uh, ni uh, is a six dimensional vector uh, which lives on a one dimensional sphere. So this, I kind of drew it to uh, um, show you the dual, the, the holographic dual in ADS CFT, but uh, I want to emphasize that, okay, this sphere here is not the, uh, the S5 of ADS5 cross S5. This is a, one, a sphere of radius one. Um, okay, so this is a very nice quantity. Uh, you can also show that it's conformal invariant in the sense that, conformal covariant, I should say, in the sense that if I act to the conformal transformation, the contour gets mapped uh, under a new contour and the observer under new contour is equal to the previous one. However, this, is, this quantity is not uh, invariant under um, super conformal transformations. Okay, so let's discuss finiteness first. So th there's a quick argument to see why uh, this uh, operator is a, is a good operator to look at. So we can look at divergences that arise from a scalar uh, field going between uh, two points on the Wilson loop and a gauge field going between two points on the uh, Wilson loop. And then we take the limit when the two points coincide and we, get, we have this type of behavior for the, uh, for the two contributions. And if the paths are smooth, then you can easily check that uh, the divergent pieces cancel in the sum. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this is a, just an argument at one loop. Uh, a rigorous proof uh, I, I haven't found in, in the literature. Uh, this probably has to do with the fact that there are some issues with uh, defining this operator. I will come back to that a bit later. Okay. So I mentioned that uh, this is not supersymmetric, so it's not super conformal, it's not supersymmetric, so let's supersymmetrize it. So in order to supersymmetrize it, um, we start uh, with space-time and we, we add some odd coordinates and uh, we, have, we have this uh, super space with coordinates x theta and theta bar and the supersymmetry transformations act as in uh, equation 2 
where rho is, a, is an odd parameter of the, that, that's uh, the spinner of the supersymmetry. And uh, now I have to introduce some super geometry. Uh, I have to define some field binary, which are supersymmetric. So since x is not invariant under supersymmetry transformations, then dx will not be invariant under supersymmetry transformations. I have to correct by adding some uh, quadratic pieces like this, where the fermionic uh, parts here are uh, transform in a, they're invariant. If I do uh, delta uh, theta equals rho, then, uh, then this EF is invariant. EB is also invariant if you go through the computation. So this can be um, written as a supersymmetric momentum um, in terms of the derivatives of x and theta with respect to a, uh, a parameter uh, on, the, on the curve. And now uh, I just uh, take the definition of the uh, Wilson loop, the bosonic Wilson loop that I showed you, and I just replace uh, all these quantities with, uh, with supersymmetric quantities. So here, if you remember, I had an x dot squared, and this I replace with pi squared, the supersymmetric momentum. Um, I had, uh, before I had here a uh, gauge field A <coughs> and a scalar field phi. So I replaced the gauge field with a super field, a gauge super field, and I replaced the scalar field with a super field corresponding to it. So this super field has an expansion in theta whose bottom component is the scalar field I had in the Boisonic case. I should discuss a bit more the uh, uh, super connection. So the super connection now can be decomposed on, uh, on this uh, super field binary. Um, before these fermionic components didn't exist, uh, the coefficient of EB um, is a super field omega B, and this can be put in a gauge where the lowest component is the gauge field. If I eliminate the auxiliary fields in a certain way, it can be written in a way which, uh, such that its lowest component is, uh, is the, uh, the A field. And uh, there's some, some connection in the fermionic directions and the phi already explained. It's, um, Okay, so this formulation is tailor-made to uh, describe super Poincaré, uh, to make the super Poincaré symmetry manifest. So I have the invariance under Q, P, and uh, Lorentz transformations is, uh, is built in. It's not yet clear that this is invariant under super conformal transformations. This is something I have to uh, come back to. Now, in order to uh, find these uh, connections, I have to introduce the description of the n equals four theory uh, in terms of uh, gauge covariant derivatives. So, basically, what happens is I take the the usual derivatives the usual space-time derivative, and I add the connection to it, and then I take the supersymmetry covariant derivatives, so these are the uh, derivatives which commute with supersymmetry transformations, anti-commute with supersymmetry transformations, uh, and I add the connection for each one of them, and finally I add a set of constraints for, uh, for these uh, anti-commutators. So these constraints define um, the field phi, now written in, a, uh, in, in terms of uh, as, a, as, a, as an anti-symmetric rank two tensor, 
uh, before I was writing it as a six-dimensional vector. And, uh, okay, these constraints, <coughs> if I go to a certain gauge, I can actually solve them iteratively uh, in the expansion of super, super fields. So these super fields can be expanded out and each one of the terms uh, at, uh, at every order in the expansion can be written out explicitly. The expression can become cumbersome, but uh, there's, a, there's a prescription to do that. It's, uh, it's not very difficult. Okay, so now comes the subtlety uh, that I mentioned. So I, I'm just going to exp explain briefly, without going into too many details. Um, so I told you that uh, the, the definition above is uh, manifestly supersymmetric, and this is true up to uh, a certain detail, which has to do with the fact that the constraints which I use to compute this theta expansion, they put the theory on shell. So it's equivalent to saying that uh, the supersymmetry algebra only closes modulo the equations of motion. Um, so if we're doing a supersymmetry transformation and this operator, uh, what happens is that we generate terms which are proportional to the equations of motion. And normally such terms are fine, but when inserted in a correlation function, they, produce, they can produce anomalies. And this happens already for a free scalar field, as, uh, as, in this, uh, as you can see in this equation here. So at the quantum level, um, there's something to prove. So it's not, at the classical level, I can just do the transformations without worrying about anything, but uh, in the quantum theory, I have to worry about these anomalies. Okay, so what Niklas told you last year was that uh, this operator is Youngian invariant. Um, and I'm just going to uh, just briefly outline the, uh, this, uh, this constraint imposed by angular invariance, uh, which is this. So I'm going to write it in a way which, um, which in which the action of the Yangian is on the path uh, on which the operator depends. Niklas described it in a way which uh, emphasized the insertion of operators in the, in the Wilson loop itself. So the Yangian, okay, the level one Yangian uh, can be written in this form. So here um, I have the transformation of coordinates x under the action of uh, the conformal group, uh, the, super, the super conformal group generator Jn. And then I have a functional derivative with respect to x mu, and then I have another uh, variation of uh, x nu and the functional derivative, and this is integrated uh, with this condition and contracted with the uh, structure constant of, uh, constant of the algebra. And, uh, okay, here I only wrote down the x. I should have written down the theta and uh, the n uh, coordinates, but I didn't have any space. So. Um, okay, so this definition is slightly subtle um, because of uh, basically what happens is that these functional derivatives, when acting at coincident points, they can give rise to some uh, distributional uh, terms. And uh, in fact, uh, these distributional terms you can see here, I uh, wrote them down for the, the variation with respect to uh, the x coordinates. Um, so there's a singular piece which has a, 
uh, derivative of the, of the delta function and the delta function part. And uh, coefficients multiplying them um, are non-singular uh, and can be written as these limits. So this is just the path and how it gets deformed in the rho and sigma um, direction by adding a, a small square. So just to uh, finish with this uh, review, what we did was we checked uh, invariance under p hat. So I have the p hat level one Yangian generator written uh, here explicitly, and uh, it can be written, uh, sorry, as a bilocal operator acting at points one and two on the, on the Wilson loop. So it's this combination. Uh, if you write out the definition, it turns out to be this combination of operators. Uh, and uh, then you can, the way to check it is you expand the Wilson loop I wrote. You expand it to first order in perturbation theory and you act with this operator on the result and uh, you should get zero. You can check this piece by piece. Uh, actually, one of the uh, essential ingredients for this to work is the vanishing of the dual Coxter number of this uh, symmetry algebra. And this, of course, happens for PSU uh, 2, 2 slash 4. OK, so let's step back for a moment and uh, discuss the kinematics. So here I'm starting in a very basic way. Consider a, a massless particle. You have a massless particle. This can be seen as a, the trajectory of this massless particle can be seen as a part of, uh, of one of these uh, Wilson loops I considered. And uh, I think this should be familiar that for a massless particle, okay, I can go to this special frame and the momentum can be written in this way, and uh, the symmetry algebra is this, and the consequence is that uh, Q2 and Q2 dot are represented trivially because of this zero here. So if I replace alpha by two and alpha dot by two, I get zero, and since this is the dagger of that, acting on a Hilbert space, they, this, uh, this uh, uh, implies that Q2 and Q2 dot are zero. So we're left with two operators, uh, sorry, four operators, A, and four operator uh, A dagger, and they have an anti-commutation relation uh, like this. And the representation of, uh, okay, a more covariant way of uh, saying this is by noticing that for a massless particle, uh, this uh, P, this bispinor P, can be written as a product of two spinners. And then uh, Q and uh, Q dagger can be uh, written uh, in terms of the lambda and lambda tilde and two operators, A and A dagger. Now, if we make a transformation, a supersymmetry transformation with parameter rho, chosen such that is of this type, then we get zero. And this is very easy to see because if I plug in this expression for A, I get a contraction lambda epsilon lambda. So epsilon is the anti-symmetric tensor so I have a symmetric tensor lambda alpha lambda beta contracted with an anti-symmetric tensor, I get zero. So half of these supersymmetries uh, don't really do anything. And that's where kappa symmetry comes in. 
And this is also important for, uh, for the super Wilson loop. So you can think in the, in the same terms. You can think of a super particle, and you can think of a part of a contour of a, of a super Wilson loop. Uh, and um, the equivalence I showed you on the previous slide um, can be written in this uh, more general case, uh, like this, where I defined uh, this x plus and x minus uh, in this way. So you notice that, in a sense, the parameterization of the path in terms of this x and theta coordinates is uh, superfluous because I have an equivalence. So the path that differs from the initial one by such a transformation uh, should be considered as, uh, as um, uh, gauge equivalent. So instead, I can define some quantities, um, x plus lambda, theta lambda, and so on, which are invariant. You can check if you contract this, um, assuming that lambda is, uh, is invariant itself. If you contract these quantities uh, with lambda, you can check that uh, you get zero. So I have these uh, objects, z and z bar. They are invariant under kappa transformations. And the other very nice thing about them is that uh, superconformal transformations just act by matrix multiplication. So they're, they're very simple uh, representations of the superconformal group. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this. Okay, so. Um, for, uh, for the case of the Wilson loop I told you about, where I had a coupling to scalars, um, there was a constraint which uh, related the momentum in space-time and the momentum, uh, momentum in, uh, in the directions, r symmetry directions. And uh, this symmetry, this uh, relation, uh, is just like a uh, uh, light-like line in 10 dimension. So we have a light-like line. Uh, effectively, uh, the kinematics is such that we, we have a light-like line in 10 dimensions. We have a 4D part P and a 6D part Q. And as before, uh, P can be written as a 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, and Q, the part of the contour which contracts with the scalars, can be written as a 4 by 4 matrix. And uh, studying the, the kappa transformations in this case, uh, and I'm not going to go through the derivation, uh, leads us to introduce uh, two matrices, lambda, which is a 4 by 2 matrix. So this lambda is different now from the lambda I was discussing before, which was just a two-dimensional uh, spinner. And a lambda tilde, which is a 2 by 4 matrix. And uh, these two uh, objects now, are uh, they satisfy these constraints. So I need to explain this a little bit. Uh, this is a 4 by 4 matrix, so I have a 4 by 2 multiplied by a 2 by 2 matrix multiplied by 2 by 4 matrix, and it's anti-symmetric, because if you do the transpose, you get minus this. And then uh, I have an anti-symmetric 2 by 2 matrix, I can contract it with the epsilon tensor, and I get some other uh, dual um, a four by four anti-symmetric matrix. So these are the constraints that uh, lambda and lambda tilde satisfy. And it turns out that uh, these are exactly the pure spinner constraints um, in a parametrization discussed by uh, Berkov Berkovitz and Fleury. Um, 
so we are, we are dealing with pure spinners, which uh, is not unheard of when discussing 10-dimensional uh, uh, light-like uh, vectors. And now I can write the uh, vectors P and Q, which define the uh, uh, contour, or for P defines the tangent to the contour. Um, sorry, this should be equal here, I wrote minus. Um, so they're given by these expressions in terms of lambda and lambda tilde. So now, when I was discussing the light-like conditions uh, from the uh, four-dimensional point of view, I had some lambda and lambda tilde, and now in this um, ten-dimensional situation, I introduce uh, two by four and four by two matrices, uh, lambda and lambda tilde, and the P and Q are uh, described in terms of them by these expressions. And then I can, su I can supersymmetrize this. So um, supersymmetrization is actually uh, pretty straightforward. I don't have time to explain, but what you end up with are uh, these types of super matrices. So lambda goes to uh, something called U, calligraphic U, which is a, matrix, a super matrix of this type. And lambda dagger goes to a super matrix V, which uh, is of this type. And you can do the same thing for lambda tilde and lambda tilde dagger. And just like for uh, the twisters, uh, which I briefly mentioned, the transformations under the uh, superconformal group are very simple. So if I act with, uh, with G, an element of the superconformal group, uh, then U gets transformed to uh, U prime, which is G U times uh, right acting compensating transformation H, uh, and for V, uh, left acting uh, compensating matrix K, which are uh, two slash two by two slash two matrices, super matrices. And you see now, if I take the product uh, V with U, then uh, this is going to under sorry, superconformal transformations, this is going to uh, transform by a left and a right multiplication. So that means the super determinant transforms uh, homogeneously. Because the super determinant of a product is a product of super determinants. Now I can write out uh, explicitly since I know uh, the expression of this U and V in terms of uh, more uh, familiar uh, quantities, I can write them out explicitly and it looks like that. So this is a super determinant of a, so U, uh, V times U, this is a two slash two by two slash two uh, super matrix so I can, I write out the uh, uh, formula for the super determinant and uh, it's this and then uh, I use uh, an expression for the determinant of a two by two matrix in terms of a trace. So this is, this is the expression you get. Here I need to explain some of the uh, notations. Uh, theta 1, 2 is pretty obvious. Uh, theta 1, 2 plus minus is this, uh, this uh, combination, which is uh, Susie invariant. So you see, uh, this is a, it's a pretty complicated expression, but it can be uh, written in terms of something very simple and manifestly super conformal covariant object. Um, now, one of the 
ingredients we had to use when we were discussing the Youngian invariance of the, the, uh, the super Wilson loop, of the smooth uh, Wilson loop, was this scalar scalar two point function. Uh, so, okay, you can consider this uh, even in the abelian theory, uh, in which case uh, phi will be uh, gauge invariant. Um, and uh, this two point function is pretty uh, non trivial. I mean, you can compute it pretty easily. Once you figure out the action of inversion, then uh, you just need to do some translations, some inversions, and this expression uh, comes out. Um, but, uh, but it's pretty non-trivial, and uh, you have to work a little bit to show that it's a super conformal uh, covariant. Now, if instead I, uh, if I take this expression and I replace the, the Q and, uh, so actually here I should maybe explain a little bit. Um, yeah, so these are, in the Wilson loop computation, these phi's, they always appear contracted with these uh, contour variables Q. So I only need to compute uh, quantities like this, so no free indices. So if I uh, replace Q uh, and Q bar in the previous expression for the two-point function, this is what I get in terms of the uh, UV, uh, U tilde, and V tilde variables. Um, so this is a nice uh, super conformal covariant, manifestly super conformal covariant expression, which has this twistorial flavor. So uh, the, uh, the super conformal transformations are, uh, are more manifest than linear. Okay, there is one single, uh, well, slight, uh, non-obvious thing here is the symmetry uh, between the exchange of one and two. So what happens is that this field phi has a duality property. So uh, if I complex, sorry, the phi bar is, uh, can be written in terms of phi with, uh, with a contraction of an epsilon tensor. So, and the same holds for the Qs, so we can actually transform uh, one and two into each other. So it turns out that uh, to show this, uh, we need some constraints. So the constraints um, obviously have to be super conformal uh, invariant. So how are we going to make some other super conformal invariants? Um, so what we did before was to take a product between 2 slash 2 times 2 slash 4 slash 2 and a, a two, four, 2 slash 4 slash 2 uh, times 2 slash 2 matrices. So we, in the end, we got uh, 2 slash 2 times 2 slash 2. But what we can also do, we can stack together two of these uh, objects. So you, I remind you, uh, had a shape like this. Okay? So uh, three rows and two columns. And if I stack together two of them, and here I have to make a slight adjustment, I have to swap the last, uh, I have to swap the two columns of you, two, in order to, to get something that they can take the super determinant of. So if I do that, okay, I get this quantity, which again is a super conformal uh, covariant, because remember, I have a left action uh, of the super conformal group, and then a right action uh, on each of these uh, U1 and U2 to compensate uh, for it. So, in terms of this notation here, 
the constraints read like this. So first I have uh, V with U tilde is zero, V tilde with U is zero, and uh, there's a relation between V tilde and U, which I wrote, uh, which I wrote here. So actually these are the analogs, the super analogs of the uh, Berkowitz uh, Fleury uh, constraints that I wrote for you earlier. And then, uh, okay, then the, the, the symmetry of the two-point function uh, follows from these constraints. Okay. So now I want to uh, go to a special gauge. So remember there's an action, there's a right action on this, uh, on these objects. And I can use this right action to make identity here. And also for, uh, for the dagger. And then if I plug in the uh, expression for Q and P, I get these expressions. And it turns out they satisfy all of the constraints as they should. And then uh, I can rewrite the Vs that I had uh, up to, a, again, an equivalence by a, by a right action. Um, and I get this, uh, this matrix. So you see this is a, a, this is a Grassmannian. You can think of this as a Grassmannian. So if I take a, a yes. So uh, the GKN Grassmannian, so this is going to be an example of Grassmannian. Here I give you a general definition. This is uh, the space of K planes through the origin of an n-dimensional space, vector space. And this can be realized as a quotient. So uh, what I can do is I can take uh, matrices of type K times N and these matrices, matrices have full rank, so here k is smaller than n, and then I can act on the left with g l k. And, uh, and then uh, by this action of g l k, the matrices can be put in a special form like this. And if you go uh, to the previous slide here, you see that I've done the same, except that uh, this is not really the identity, but it's a, it's a slightly uh, different matrix. So one thing to emphasize here is that uh, if I write uh, V in this uh, special gauge uh, with X defined by this matrix here, then the product uh, v times u tilde is actually a difference of coordinates. And these x are coordinates on a 2 slash 2 inside 4 slash 4 Grassmannian. I can do the same for x uh, tilde. And uh, in that case, I get uh, that v1 times u2 tilde is a super determinant of x12, so the difference between x12 and uh, um, v tilde, this should be 1 and 2. Uh, this is the super determinant of x tilde 1, 2. So out of the four terms that uh, appeared in the two-point function of uh, the scalar fields, two of them can be written in a nice uh, way because they have the form of super, de super determinant of a difference of coordinates on, a, on, a, on the super Grassmannian. So this is, uh, I think, very important because um, one of the questions you can ask is why does this uh, operator have Youngian invariance? And the way this was explained from the strong coupling point of view for the uh, polygonal Wilson loops was by, uh, as a consequence of fermionic T duality. 
So what happened there was that um, in the sigma model, you could think of uh, uh, some uh, isometries. Some of them were bosonic, some of them were fermionic. The bosonic isometries you can uh, gauge in the usual way, and you obtain the, uh, the t-dual um, uh, model. And you could do the same with the uh, uh, fermionic ones, and this canceled some uh, contributions, which you didn't want. Um, and this operation also transformed local charges on the world sheet to non-local charges on the world sheet. Um, and there's, there's another set of uh, T-dualities you could do, as was shown by uh, Berkowitz and Malasena, um, which are just, from the group theoretic uh, analysis, they're just the same as these uh, translations of uh, uh, coordinates of this Grassmannian. So they can be thought of as doing a T-duality in these uh, X directions. Uh, however, uh, I mean, we're not exactly, this operator we're discussing here is not exactly the same, it's not adapted to doing this T-duality because we have two such coordinates. We have the X and the X tilde. So uh, what should we do? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, should we do both? Should we do neither? Uh, maybe we should do a non-abelian uh, T-duality. I don't know. Um, so uh, I'm going to end with some open questions. Um, one of the um, things to study now is uh, to think of Youngian invariance in terms of these U and V variables. So if you restrict to this more familiar space-time parametrization in terms of x's, x plus, x minus, and thetas, and so on. Um, it's very hard to uh, come up with Youngian invariance. I mean, it's already hard to come up with superconformal invariance. Uh, but in these U and V variables, which have uh, some simpler transformations, and which arise in a natural way for this uh, two-point uh, scalar uh, correlation function, um, there's more hope. Um, then there's uh, um, the question of w how much can we achieve going along the path that uh, was followed in the case of, uh, of the twister uh, formulation of uh, um, of these Wilson loops, the polygonal ones, uh, where there is a nice way of uh, computing them in a, in a holomorphic chain Simons theory plus uh, some uh, some extra term. Uh, clarify it would be nice to clarify the role played by pure spinners. Maybe uh, the pure spinner formulation of the string is. Uh, is useful to, to make contact with this, uh, with this uh, light-like uh, Wilson loop. And finally, uh, the question I mentioned on, previ on the previous slide, uh, understanding this uh, T-duality, which explains uh, the Youngian symmetry. Thank you. We don't have a practical way of using it to compute expectation values, no. The hope is that it does, but uh, how to practically do it, uh, I can't tell you. Uh, 
Well, it, it's not exactly the same, right? I mean, no. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, so uh, it, it has to be, you have to have a charge, a charge which globally uh, preserves it. Okay, so what happens here is that you have local supersymmetry, so on every bit of the, of the, you have some local supersymmetry, but globally there's no charge that preserves it. So then you can't use localization. Yeah, it's local. So, so yeah, for, for localization, you have to have a global, global charge that preserves it. And, 